boldly going where no science show has gone before. The Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Naked Scientists, and that's with Helen Scales. Hello, Helen. Hello. With Dave Ansel. Hi, Dave. Hi, Chris. Uh, kitchen science and physics guru, and of course I'm Chris Smith. Now this week, how bugs splattered on car windscreens are helping scientists to work out how many species there are on Earth. Also, how a big step forward has happened in the light sensing technology arena, and that could help scientists to produce cameras that are not much thicker than a single piece of paper. And finally, is a virus responsible for chronic fatigue syndrome? Scientists in the US have come up with some tantalising evidence and will reveal what it is to you very shortly. Helen. Thanks, Chris. This week it's also our science question and answer show, so we'll be tackling all your science questions, including finding out why water expands when it freezes, how cold-blooded species survive at very low temperatures, and can an astronaut push himself through space by shining a laser or a torch at something? The answers to all those and many more are on their way. Dave. Thanks, Helen. And for Kitchen Science this week, I'll show you a neat feat to explain the effects of pressure. If you want to have a go, grab a biro, a potato. You need something like a hacksaw to cut the biro, and I'll be doing the experiment live on the show very shortly. Thank you, Dave. 101 million things to do with a biro, apart from right with it, of course. That's all coming up. Meanwhile, if you have a question for us here at The Naked Scientist, so you just want to phone in, say hi, the best way to get in touch, of course, chris at thenakedscientist.com by email. The Naked Scientist Podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. So, first of all this week, I have a big question for you. How many living species are there in the world? It's a huge question and there's no doubt there's going to be a really huge answer to it. And we, at the moment, don't really have any idea exactly how many species there might be that we still haven't found. Well, now scientists from America have come up with a possible new way of making the process a lot quicker. It involves scraping the splatter of dead bugs off a car windscreen. What about if you live somewhere very rural and you might hit something bigger than a dead bug? Uh, or it's a live bug when you hit it. What about a deer and things like that? Were they, were they included in the analysis? <laughs> Not in this particular one, and I suspect they might have known it was a deer anyway. And we are talking about very small things that maybe so far haven't quite been identified by science. But this paper, which appears in the journal Genome Research, and it's actually freely available online, and we'll put a link up to it. And it was a research team led by Anton Nekrotenko from Penn State University. And they developed a piece of really clever online software, and it's called Galaxy. It's basically a aiming to help make the estimation of biodiversity based on DNA sequences that have been extracted from the environment a much easier process. And this is something that's known as metagenomics. And until now, metagenomics has been used to assess the diversity of really tiny creatures, including bacteria living in deep sea sediments or even on the surface of human skin. And it essentially evolves taking samples from the environment of material, reading the sequences of DNA from those samples, and then using that to estimate the the number of different species that were present on that particular environment. And presumably uh, the DNA survives the splatter process. Absolutely. That's one of the key parts is that you are recovering intact stretches, maybe not the whole chromosomes. But then the big problem is linking those sequences back to something meaningful in terms of numbers of species. And uh, that's really the problem that these guys are trying to address with this particular piece of software. Because what they're doing is they're taking the back-breaking hard work out of having to analyse the sequences, match them up to ones that we might already know, look at really what that's meaning for us in terms of where the samples are coming from. And they're doing this in what they're calling a metagenomic pipeline, which I think essentially means you shove all the information in one end, it spurts out something meaningful and interesting the other end. So researchers can use this tool, they can adapt it and they can make it better and easily use it to have a look at their own samples. But these guys tested it out themselves with two cars. One of them was driven from uh, Pennsylvania to Connecticut, the other one from Maine uh, to New Brunswick in Canada. And then they basically scraped the windscreens. And what they found was that there were a number of groups that they could recognise of species. And uh, they also discovered there was a difference in the diversity diversity of those two samples. So this is a quick and some ways dirty way of identifying what species are there. Certainly um, dirty if your windscreen's covered in splatter bugs. But the problem yeah, is what about it. if people go long distances in their car? And two, DNA technology being so sensitive as it is, is there not a danger that there's going to be some contamination? If you're trying to do a geographical study and someone once drove up
up through Scotland and got some midges splattered on their windscreen, and that was a few months ago. There's a likelihood the DNA might still be there. And if you then looked at the area around London, for example, opposite end of the country, you might get skewed data. No, you're absolutely right. And I, I don't think they're really proposing that the driving around and, and using your car is the way you'd necessarily collect your data. I think they're really just showing that this is, it's possible, even, that, even with that, bearing that in mind, in the contamination that you can have. But you can still have interesting results. You can think of much more sterile and more replicable ways of collecting that data. They're just showing that it's possible. And one of the key things here, I think, is that um, as sequencing techniques become easier and cheaper, we are actually going to see a much a great increase in the catalogue of species that have had their genome sequenced. And I think it's just an interesting, a new way of thinking about what lives in the world around us. And more correctly, what did live before it got <laughs> splattered on your windscreen. Absolutely. Now, di- digital cameras have got immensely better and far cheaper over the, la- over the pre- recent years, but they're still not perfect. They're still quite expensive and complicated, partly because they're analogue devices. Each pixel converts light into a variable amount of charge. Then circuitry has to digitise this voltage, converting it into a number, normally from 0 to 256. It also means that they don't have a large dynamic range. They're very bad at taking photos of both bright things and dark things at the same time. Essentially, you run out of numbers between 0 and 256. Now, Eduardo Charbon from the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands might have a solution. Basically, get rid of the analogue part entirely and make each pixel return only a 1 or a 0. This might sound like a stupid way of getting a good image because it's going to just produce something which looks like a photocopy. But because the sensors are so much more simple, you can get far more sensors in the same space. So what's the difference? between what he's proposing and what we have at the moment? At the moment, each pixel um, gives you a number from maybe 0 to 256. This is the, the CCD chip in the, the, the camera? Each yeah. little pixel inside the chip. Whereas he's suggesting using much, many more far smaller pixels which either return 1 or 0. Now, this actually does work quite well because of, of something called noise. Although the sensor should be returning a 1, sometimes it won't it return a 0, and well, either it might, should be returning a 0, it might sometimes return a 1. And the probability of it returning a 1 increases as the light level goes up. So if you take, say, a 1,000 um, of these little tiny sensors, which only return a 1 or a 0, then average, the average will change smoothly with the light level. And it's really useful because of the statistics which you're using. The value you read changes very rapidly when it's very dark, so you get good sensitivity at something, looking at something very dark. And it changes much more slowly as it gets very bright, in the same way as your, your eyes do exactly the same thing. Um, and this means you can take photos of thing, useful photos of things which have got areas which are very dark and areas which are very bright all at the same time. And also, you don't have to have the sensors which you're collecting for each pixel all in one place. You could take, make an array of like 100 lenses and then have lots of little cameras all lined up and then sort of join the top left pixel from all of those 100 little cameras and add them all up and average it. And so and because how thick a camera is is to do with how far the lens has to be away from the um, sensor and how big the sensor is, if you make the, each sensor really small, you can make the camera incredibly thin. So maybe only a millimetre thick. So it's really down to a question of size. It's, it's an, a way of making these things much, much smaller so that you can pack more of them in. And that in turn means that then you can make use of this, this noise statistics phenomenon to, to get this really smooth gradation. Sorry. No problem with colour? Um, well, you probably do colour in exactly the same way. You put little filters over the different pixels so you get different co- so they pick up different colours. Now, this might kind of just be interesting if it was expensive to make these things, but it turns out that conventional memory chips are light sensitive. If you scrape off the black um, plastic over the top, they're light sensitive. So he, he's suggesting that almost all you need to do to make a good light sensor is take a memory chip, scrape the outside off, maybe do a bit of optimization, and you should be able to get a very cheap um, image sensor. I mean, I, personally, I think that what's really exciting about that is maybe we can use these to go and study wildlife and send, you know, this is opening up opportunities for putting cameras out into the world and finding out more things. I think it was just this week that there were albatross carrying cameras around, taking photographs of um, them flying around the Southern Ocean and fishing with killer whales, alongside killer whales. And that was fairly grainy. But if we can make tiny millimetre think cameras, just think what we could do. It's fantastic. I was going to come up with a horrible pun, and since I thought of it, I still will. So making better cameras in future is going to be a PC of cake, is the bottom line, isn't it? Mm. Well, if you went, and it made you feel like you might have chronic fatigue syndrome, having heard me actually talk about that and make that horrible joke... um, there's a big step forward in, in the world of chronic fatigue syndrome this week because scientists uh, over in America have made a link between a virus and chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, chronic fatigue is, it's got a, na- a range of different names and 
there's not really any consensus in the medical world as to exactly what this is. But people who actually have it, and there's something like 17 million people worldwide, that's 1% of, of the population of most countries probably, are actually suffering with this. People explain that they have symptoms of profound lethargy, tiredness, exhaustion. But they're backed up, these symptoms, by also changes in the way these people's immune systems work. You can find that they have too few of a certain kind of white blood cell called a natural killer cell. And you can also find that they have signs of chronic inflammation going going on inside the body. But no one's ever found a reason for that until now. And a group of researchers uh, at the Whitmore P Peterson Institute in Maryland, this is Vincent Lombardi and his colleagues, have got a paper in Science this week where they took blood from 101 people who were diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and they compared the blood with 218 people who didn't have the syndrome and they were looking for DNA signatures of certain viruses and they found a match. There's one virus called xenotropic murine leukemia virus related virus and because it takes 15 years to say that, that's why we call it XMRV. But this virus is a relative of a virus that's normally carried by laboratory and normal mice. In fact, it's a retro and endogenous retrovirus in those mice. It's actually integrated in the genome of those mice. So it's not actually infectious to mice because it's already living in their body all the time. They pass it from one generation to the next. But it can be passed on potentially to humans. And it looks like these people who have chronic fatigue syndrome have this particular virus signature in their body. The researchers went a step further. They were able to show that the cells of these people actually are making virus and it can be transmitted from one cell to another when they incubated some of the blood cells in these people with blood from another person who didn't have the disease the new cells took up the infection and started making it. There's also antibodies in the bloodstream of these patients, and this suggests that there is something in this. 67% of the samples from chronic fatigue syndrome positive patients had this virus signature in them, compared with only about 4% of normal people. So it suggests there's some kind of association, but what it doesn't tell us is if the virus is there as some kind of red herring or if it's really linked to the syndrome. It could be that people who have chronic fatigue syndrome have some kind of immune deficit. Their immune system doesn't work as well and therefore they're more likely to carry this virus and therefore it's, it's absolutely nothing to do with it. On the other hand, it could be that it's actually linked to it causally. So that's a big question that needs answering. Are we going to answer it? Is there plans to, to move that forward and, and see what's going on? Indeed, scientists are very interested in that for this, the simple reason that just four weeks ago there was another paper in the journal PNAS um, and in this group of researchers they were able to show that prostate cancer is also linked to this virus, XMRV. 25% of patients who had prostate cancer, there were signs of the DNA of this virus within the cancer cells but not in healthy tissue in those patients. And also people who had prostate cancer with this virus in the cancers had higher grade, more aggressive cancers. But again, it could be just that cancer cells are more permissive, they're more likely to get infected with this virus. There could also be something wrong with the immune system in people who have prostate cancer, and therefore they might be more vulnerable to catching it, and that needs disentangling. I mean, that's a really big, important question that now needs answering. Absolutely, it does. Well, more news from the, nat the natural world from me, and more predictions that are emerging this week about how climate change is likely to affect the planet. And this time, scientists from the Sea Around Us project, based at the University of British Columbia in Canada, have turned their attention to how the shifting climate could impact the world's fisheries. And, as you might imagine, sadly enough, it's not very good news news. Within the next 50 years, we could be seeing the catches of fish in the tropics falling by around 40% compared to today. And that's down to the changing climate. And uh, But however, in areas further north and south, fisheries could in fact expand by as much as 30 or even 70% because of climate changes. Now this is William Chung, Daniel Pauley and colleagues who've run computer models of over a thousand different marine species which encompass together about 70% of the world's fisheries. And that ranges from krill to sharks and this week's European Shark Week so uh, sharks are definitely on the agenda at the moment. Keep an eye out for those. And uh, what they did was they plugged in environmental and biological factors into their model about what affects the distribution of all these different species. And therefore, if you change the climate under a couple of different scenarios that we're looking at, um, how would that affect the distribution of these particular fish? Now, well, under these models, certain countries will see fish disappearing from their nets. And that includes Chile, China, the US and Indonesia. And that's really simply because because fish will not survive in higher temperatures. They'll either they'll go locally extinct if they can't swim fast enough to escape those temperature changes, 
or they'll move. And that movement is why some countries will see an increase in fish populations, potentially um, countries including Russia, Norway, Greenland and Alaska, or cold countries at the moment, could be seeing an influx of these species that previously lived in warmer waters further south, trying to kind of maintain the conditions that they are used to living in. Now, the main issue, I think, that kind of comes off this study is that for people living in poorer parts of the world, including lots of those tropical countries, there's so many people who really heavily rely on the seas for a source of food and for income. So this really could spell disaster for those people. And it it goes hand in hand with other studies that are predicting that climate change is going to lead to all sorts of chaos on land in terms of food production. So really, together, that does spell fairly gloomy bad news. You can read more about that the journal um, Global change biology is where this paper has been has been published and the sea around us um, have also got a website with more stuff there basically the researchers are keen to point out that uh, there are other things they haven't included in their models so really what we're looking at here unfortunately could be not certainly not the worst case scenario they haven't considered things like ocean acidification which is we know one thing that is going to come along with climate change and they also don't look at the very worst case scenario for climate change itself the international panel for climate change the ipcc have got a really bad prediction of what could happen if things aren't changed in the next few years and they haven't considered that in this model either so this really is just the tip of the iceberg really in terms of what might happen to fish now modern electronics is getting smaller and more capable all the time and all sorts of cool new sensors and communication systems being developed sense chemicals forces and communicate them back to a base station you still have to power these systems and chemical batteries have a limited life and also get much less efficient as they get smaller Now, one obvious really high-density form of energy is from radioactive decay. This stores at least 100 times more energy in in the same amount of stuff. Um, But the problem is getting the energy out of it. Now, various spacecraft generate energy from heat produced by radioactive decay. This is inefficient, um, particularly if you're somewhere which is very, very hot. It doesn't scale down to being very, very small. Now, another approach is to use the radiation directly to stimulate a structure like a solar cell, which will produce electricity in the same way as it would do with light. Uh, essentially um, it, it normally takes in energy from light and that um, knocks off an electron off a piece of sodium atom, a uh, silicon atom and then that f- goes around the circuit um, you can do the same thing with radioactive decay um, and it can be scaled down very small the problem is that all this radiation tends to damage the crystal structure and conventional semiconductors are very very um, susceptible to damage to damage to their structure and they stop working it gets less and less efficient now, researchers at the University of Missouri may have come, come up with a way around this. Um, use a semiconductor which isn't set crystalline in the first place and is in fact liquid. How on earth does that work? Um, normal semiconductors are very, very dependent on the crystal structure and it just happens that selenium will semiconduct perfectly happily um, any orientation, even as a liquid, any sort of orientation of crystals. And, so, and this means that if radiation hits the atoms, they get displaced but there's no crystal there in the first place. So what do you do? You warm the selenium up so it stays as a liquid rather than being in a solid form? Yeah, um, I think they were probably I think they were running it quite warm, um, so it was li- liquefied, and I think it probably also started off amorphous, so it didn't have a crystal structure in the first place, so it would be less damaged anyway, even if it was cool. Wow, so the radiation that you'd mix with it would come in, basically shove energy into the selenium, this would then be tapped off and would run a circuit. Run, run a circuit. And, and because there was no fixed crystal arrangement to get knocked off kilter by the energy from the radiation, it, it should it be impervious to that effect. Yeah, it doesn't affect it. It will get, it will get damaged, the atoms will get moved around, but it doesn't care because it was a random structure to start with. When do we think we might see this on the production line? Well, at the moment they've made a battery which is smaller than a 2p coin. Um, it's not very pre- powerful, it only produces about 16 nanowatts, um, but the efficiency is about 1.2% and it doesn't degrade over time. Um, um, and they reckon it's early days and it should get a lot more powerful. You're never going to be plugging them into a stereo system, but um, for very specialist um, sort of sensors and things, you might see it in a few years' time. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dave. Well, also this week, we've, of course, had the Nobel Prizes being awarded and before that, the Ig Nobels, but that's a different story. And we're joined now by Richard Van Norden, who is an assistant news editor with Nature, and he's going to tell us a bit more about them. Hello, Richard. Hi, Chris. Welcome yeah, back it's... to uh, The Naked Scientist. So tell us a bit about the Nobels this week. Who got what? Well, um, interesting that you should be talking about uh, cameras and CCDs and how to turn light into electronics because the physics prize uh, this week went to uh, Willard Boyle and George Smith for their work on inventing the CCD, the thing in your digital camera that, that turns optical light into a digital picture. 
and also to Charles Cow, and he worked on fibre optic cables, those uh, billions of kilometres of fibre optic cables spanning the globe, and the uh, light bounces along inside them by total internal reflection, and uh, it's a very efficient way of carrying a signal. Indeed, we couldn't basically have the internet without fibre optics, could we? Exactly so. Now, the other prizes uh, in physiology or medicine uh, went to Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greider and Jack Sostak for their work on telomeres. Uh, these are essentially the caps at the end of your chromosomes, the, uh, the things your DNA is wrapped up in, and they're sort of protective caps. Um, and what Blackburn and, and Greider and Sostak found was exactly how these telomeres worked and what they do. And what happens is whenever your cells divide, you need to make new cells and you need to copy your DNA. The DNA polymerase, the enzyme that reads your DNA, um, can't quite read to the end of the chromosome and it would get frayed like a piece of frayed string. And you can imagine your cells would keep dividing and your chromosomes would cre keep fraying and in the end um, your DNA would actually degrade. And what these telomere caps do is they add on to the end of the chromosomes. They're repetitive DNA structures. They keep getting built anew every time. And so they prevent the cells that, that carry them um, from, from degrading. But you also need an enzyme to, to build them up called telomerase um, that builds up the telomeres. And this, for example, is what you have in cells that are immortal cells that um, never cell ever stop dividing. Yes, cancerous cells. So many, many cells that turn cancerous also have this enzyme telomerase, but not just cancerous cells, also stem cells, those cells that can um, turn into many other different types of cells. So <clears throat> it's what they did, what Blackburn and Greider and Shostak did, is, is work out how this process is working and what the structures are. And nowadays, the hope is that we could perhaps use this to understand stem cells better, possibly to attack tumorous cells, cancerous cells. Um, and really, um, the possibilities are endless here. What about chemistry? Another subject dear to my heart. Yeah, chemistry prize. Uh, another biological prize, interestingly enough. It went to Adiyonath uh, Venkatraman Ramakrishnan, who works in Cambridge, just uh, just a few uh, miles away from where you are, and, uh, and Thomas Stites uh, in the US. And um, their prize was for working out the structure of the ribosome, the protein-making factory in, in all of our cells. Um, <clears throat> what the ribosome does is it, it takes DNA, which is, as it were, the blueprint, um, and then it has to translate that into the proteins, the things that actually do the work in your cells, that buzz around and do all the reactions. And uh, Yonath, um, back in the 1980s, decided that this enormous ribosome structure contains over a million atoms. She decided she'd try to crystallize it so you could bounce x-rays through it and from the way they were scattered, work out where the atoms were. Everybody else thought this was a ridiculous idea, but she did manage to crystallize some ribosomes by taking um, some ribosomes from organisms that lived in the, in the Dead Sea at uh, very high temperatures. Their ribosomes are very stable and, and easier to crystallize. And then uh, Ramakrishnan and Stites came along and they worked out the exact structure of the ribosome. They actually completed this, this task in 2000. Now, what's interesting about this is that we're now just working on antibiotics um, that can attack the ribosomes of bacteria. Remember, you need your ribosomes to make proteins. So what we're trying to work on, in fact, Stites Group have a, a company um, that are doing this, is to get antibiotics that, by attacking ribosomes, prevent bacteria from making proteins and therefore stop the bacteria dividing. This could be a way to basically attack bacteria that have become resistant to the antibiotics we have at the moment. Fantastic. Well, Richard, thank you for joining us to tell us all about that. I won't ask you to comment on the Peace Prize, uh, somewhat controversial, of course. Thank you very much. That's Richard Van Norden, who is from the journal Nature, bringing us up to speed on this week's Nobel Prize winners. Bringing the facts to bear. The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientists with Chris Smith. Helen Scales and Dave Ansell. It's our science phone-in this week, so we're answering all your science questions. And Sasha Zanjani is on the telephone with a question for us. Hello, Sasha. Hello, hi. Yeah. Good to have you with Great. us. Good evening. Great show. Thank you very uh, much. Hi. Tell us your question. OK, would like to know, can plants get cancer? What's your instinct, Tally? What do you think? Um, I don't know. You can get growths on them, but I don't know whether they would be the same type of cancerous growth that you would get in... Uh, 
humans and mammals and so forth. You've hit the nail on the head. You're absolutely spot on with the, the fact that you can get growths on plants. Cancer, in the context of a human, is quite a specialist disorder. Um, what we mean by cancer are cells that have lost the ability to obey the normal signals that control and dictate how things grow and move and obey signals that tell them not to go to other places in the body and not to grow through boundaries of tissues and not to disobey kill yourself signals because every cell in the body is programmed to die unless it's told otherwise. Cancer cells ignore that signal and so they are immortal as Richard Van Norden was saying and they also disobey all those normal regulatory signals they can spread to other bits of the body and cause secondary tumours and it's usually those secondary tumours that cause problems. Now plants don't have a disease like that. They don't get secondary spread through their system of disease which starts in one part of the plant and goes elsewhere, at least in the form of, of the cells from the plant itself. But they can get localised growths, a cancer-like phenomenon, and just like some human cancers which can be triggered by microorganisms, cervical cancer for example is caused by infection with a virus, human papillomavirus, also gastric cancer in the stomach is caused by a bacterial infection, Helicobacter pylori is strongly associated with gastric cancers. In plants there is a uh, an environmental organism, it's called Agrobacterium tumor fasciens. This is a soil-dwelling bacterium, and it has something called a transposon. This is a piece of genetic material which the bacterium injects into the plant's own genetic material, and that transposon carries genes which code for growth factors, and it causes the plant cells to begin to grow out of control. And the idea is to produce a big growth locally on the plant that then gives a home and provides protection to bacteria. And that's a gall. And it's very, very common. It's called crown gall disease when the plants actually have it, but it doesn't spread critically to other bits of the plant. So there are some similarities between human cancers and animal cancers and plant, and plant tumours like crown gall disease, but it's not the same disease. There's nothing systemic, as far as I know, that does the same thing. But it's a very okay. good question. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us on the programme anyway. Good to have your input. Thank you very much. Take care then. Bye. Right, Dave, got a question. For who, this is from Neil Denham, and he says, why is glass transparent? I've heard that glass can be made from sand. How is this, given that sand is not transparent, you can't see through it, but you can see through glass? Well, if you look very, very carefully at a single grain of sand, especially if you've polished up the surfaces, it is actually transparent. Um, I've looked through lumps of sand. Uh, it's actually basically quartz white, um, white sand um, in, through microscopes. If you, as long as it's polished, you can see through it. So sand is intrinsically transparent. The reason why you can't see through it on the beach is because it's in lots of lumps. Now, if you've ever looked at like a it looked at the world through a glass or a, gla a piece of glass, especially if it's curved, everything looks distorted behind it um, because when light hits it, it slows down, it bends, it goes around a corner, it gets refracted, and the light kind of gets bounced off. Now, if you're looking at something large, you can still make up a picture behind that. But if if you've got thousands, if you imagine thousands and thousands of very small glasses, they'd all, the light would all get refracted off one, it would get reflected off some others, and you'd, all the pictures would get mixed up and mixed up and mixed up until eventually they all got overlaid one another and it looks white. So it must be the same phenomenon as snow looking white, but the water it's made from, if you sit in a fish tank, is transparent. Yeah, and even and ice is also transparent. And then you've got sort of yellow sands, black sands, the other impurities that are giving it that kind of tinge of a different colour pattern. Yeah, you get different rocks in it. Um, if black sands are normally from basalts, which is intrinsically black, and those just aren't transparent, um, you get other bits of plagiar clays and all sorts of things in there. Now, talking of sand and beaches, back to your favourite subject, Helen, which is uh, fishes and things, John Harrison says, how do cold-blooded species cope in cold water? We all know that reptiles have to sun themselves to build up the energy or ability to sustain their activity, in other words, get to the right temperature. And this is attributed to the fact they're cold-blooded. How is it then possible for other cold-blooded species like fish and invertebrates like octopus, squid and so on to sustain the high levels of activity that they do but they can live in near freezing or actually freezing water? Well, that's a great question and I think um, it will be all about their, the answer is to do with their metabolic, their metabolic rates and the fact that they can operate at those low temperatures. But I, I actually want to go into detail a little bit on what you caught at the end, the freezing species, because I think this is the most interesting thing that was discovered back in the 1960s, which is that there are fish in the Antarctic that create antifreeze, and that's how they live in very cold uh, temperatures. Because the, the, the crazy thing about the sea is that it doesn't actually freeze until minus 1.9 degrees centigrade, whereas normally water freezes at zero, we know that. But it's because of those the salts and the various impurities in water... Uh, 
in seawater, that means that um, ocean temperatures can get extremely low indeed, especially down there in the Southern Ocean. Um, and so these Antarctic cod, it was discovered that they have glycoproteins in their blood. Um, that means that their, their, their tissues, their, their fluids inside them don't freeze until minus two degrees centigrade. So they're safe in the, in the sea. And what those, the glycoproteins work in a very clever way by actually attack, uh, attaching to the surface of small ice crystals by plugging gaps, if you like, between them. And that stops them from getting any bigger so that the, um, the fish themselves don't actually freeze, despite the fact that they are, they are sub-zero in temperatures. And that's really rather cool. But then there are other th- reasons why they, they don't actually manage to swim around all the time. And they are um, affected to some extent by what temperature it, there is and, and what's going on in the environment. Because it was discovered last year that um, fish in the Antarctic hibernate. The first fish that were shown to actually slow down, slow their heart rate, slow their movements um, when it's very cold and dark. And it could actually be because it's dark and they need to be able to see to be able to catch their food. So in fact, what they do is go, OK, fine, we'll have a bit of a rest while we can't find our food and wake up when, when it gets warmer and lighter. So it's a combination of inbuilt antif- antifreeze together with um, enzymes that are optimised to work at, higher t- at low temperatures, That's unlike right. our enzymes that work best and drive our chemical reactions at high temperatures. These animals have enzymes that work really well at low temperatures, so they have the energy they need. They don't need that high temperature to, to run. And when things get really bad, they just go to sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds ideal. Sounds Indeed. like student life to me. <laughs> right, Dave, experimental time. Tell us about this week's Kitchen Science. Kitchen Science this week, um, it's quite simple. Basically, what you want to do is get an old biro, uh, a fairly standard biro. Basically, we're trying to make a t- you want to make a tube about the size of a biro. If you've got one which is a tube already, that's wonderful. Uh, I had to take my biro, take the innards out of it, and then saw the two ends off it. You could have sawn off biro. It sounds yeah, like sawn off something biro. you rob a bank with. <laughs> We'll get on to that in a minute. Um, okay, and then uh, what also tends to help a bit is if you can make the holes in each end slightly conical. So I just put a, a pair of nail scissors in there and kind of mo- spit, spun them around and made the holes slightly conical. Then what I'm going to do later is jam each end of this tube into a potato about a centimetre in, turn it around, jam the other one in about a centimetre in, and I've got a rod which just fits inside the tube, and I'm going to push one of these lumps of potato which is jammed in down the tube point it somewhere and what's going to happen to the other one <laughs> so, <laughs> i was going to say should you look into the end of the tube as you know point, <laughs> point it somewhere with nothing else with nothing at all dangerous does that give you any hints <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think will happen with dave's experiment have a go or speculate or if you'd like to send in your thoughts questions and feedback for us here at the naked scientist you can twitter at us if you like uh, our twitter name is naked scientist our email address chris at the naked Keeping you abreast of the world's best science, The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist. Now, it's been a while since we've had an update on the world of technology, so it's time to join our resident expert, Chris Valance, for a summary of what's been going on over the summer, as well as an insight into the social effects of the technology boom in India. Well, it has been a while since we spoke, and in the intervening months, I think there were two events which for me highlighted the way that technology is changing, and and I think we should talk about. You'd have to have been hiding under a rock to miss the first one. That's the 40th anniversary of the Apollo moon landings. Obviously, the Apollo landing is important for technology. You see early uses of things like integrated circuits, fuel cells. Obviously, people debate and discuss the contribution to technology that those uh, landings made. But certainly events that are very important for people with an interest in space and the technologies surrounding it. And we fast forward to September and we have the announcement that one of the new countries to enter into space exploration, India, the Indian Chandrayaan probe, had discovered evidence of water on the moon. Now, it's interesting for us to talk about India at the moment because obviously everybody hears about the Indian tech boom and what that means for the country. A lot of it focused around the city of Bangalore. One of my colleagues has just been there, Jamila Knowles, who's been looking at what this most tech-enabled of Indian cities can say about how technology is changing the social relations in India between the haves and the have-nots, obviously a country where there is a, still a great gulf between those two groups. What did you find? Um, I found things that you, you would probably expect if you start reading about Bangalore, that the, the area of poverty, the population is, is huge in comparison with those who are employed, say. And also that there are huge areas throughout the city of uh, migrant workers living in slums, basically building glass, shiny edifices to technology that we use. So it's, it's quite stark. But it's something that's been happening for the last decade or so. So it's looking more 
at the kind of politics and the, the consciousness of people who are in Bangalore as a city. Uh, I went across to the Centre for Internet and Society and spoke to Nishant Shah, who's the Director of Research, and he was talking about a sort of a feeling uh, and a consciousness generally of people having a relationship with the internet, and that would be even people who have never even used a computer. So the case study in Ahmedabad, which is where the people who were living in slums on the riverfront, on the, on the Sabarmati riverfront, are now demolishing their own houses and are being employed by the state to do that in order to build an IT skyline for the city. Mm. There is no resentment amongst the people. There seems to be no protest initiated by civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of talk to the people, they keep on telling you it's because of that internet. Mm -hmm. And they've never seen a computer and they've never been online and they don't know what the internet is about. Mm -hmm. But they imagine themselves as having access to the internet by building this particular kind of infrastructure. These are the invisible people of the IT story. These are people we no longer talk about. We always talk about either people in call centers or in back processing offices or offshore development centers or, you know, startups who are working on technology, mm -hmm. people who are visible and who have a voice mm -hmm. and who are so quintessentially a part of technology that mm -hmm. we forget that there is an entire support system which is also defined by internet technologies in India. And then we start talking about IT cities and IT parks and so on. There are these people who are aspirationally or experientially a part of the internet paradigm, but not the technology. So that's fascinating. So people who are the very poorest people in Bangalore, completely separate from the tech boom, have this idea of the internet, but they've never actually used it. It's almost as though it's in the air. It's everyone from auto rickshaw drivers, from from children in schools that are really in need. You know, these are kids who, who live with parents who, who move around the city looking for work as labourers and often suffering from, you know, skin conditions, from malnutrition. But they understand, they know why their city is changing. Is the internet benefiting these people in any way, apart from the economic benefits? Whether they're getting direct benefits from the internet is difficult to say. Some of the online companies will say yes, because they will go to rural areas and show local people or farmers here's the internet, it's great, but essentially they'll put it on a bus, which will then drive away again, so it's quite difficult to see that. Um, but going back to things like education, which seems to be underpinning their hopes for for improvement, they are doing things like sourcing information online in educational centres, then burning CDs, which become educational supplements for teachers in rural areas, because they may not have the skills in, say, sciences or mathematics that maybe teachers who are in urban areas do, so they can actually record a lesson and send it out and supplement that with information that they found online. Did you get a sense there were almost two cities, the bright, shiny new city, and there was the older city of people who didn't have access to the technology? Definitely. And the thing is, it's, it's quite often the migrant workers from other states who don't have the access. Local people in Bangalore have a slightly different argument with the fact that basically they've been overrun with people from all over the world and all over the country thinking of Bangalore as one of the places that might be paved with gold when it comes to employment. And instead there's a great deal of unemployment and it's happening to them as well because their, their population's just exploded and they're not necessarily trained up to go and work in IT support, to go and work in a call centre, to go and work as a developer or a code. I mean, that's far beyond the ken of many of the people who live there. Yes, India really is an amazing place when it comes to IT, isn't it? That was our um, resident technology expert, Chris Valance, giving us an update on all things technological. He was, of course, talking to uh, the BBC's news journalist, who is Jamila Knowles. And I have to say, the, the pace of change with you know outsourcing to India and all this kind of thing is just amazing, the, the amount of work that's actually going there. We, I know of people who are sending medical work to India because they, instead of employing a secretary here to type things up the next day, they send all their clinic notes to India overnight because of the time difference. They come in in the morning and the, the work is all done. It's come back to them on the internet. Incredible stuff. Right, uh, we've got lots of fantastic questions here. Martin, Dave, says to you, uh, why does ice expand and other things contract when it's frozen? And that's very similar to another question from Ruben uh, Barnard, who said pretty much the same thing. Why does water expand when it freezes? Basically, the default thing for things to do is to shrink because normally um, if you make something hotter, it's vibrating more. If something vibrates, it tends to take up more space, so it tends to expand. Ice is very unusual in that as it gets colder, it's vibra essentially vibrating less, but it does expand. And the reason to do that 
the reason for that is to do with the strange shape of water. If you've ever seen a picture of a water molecule, it looks like a Mickey Mouse head with a sort of um, oxygen molecule where Mickey Mouse's face is and then two hydrogen atoms where his ears are. And it's sort of it's bent, basically. And the oxygen atom is slightly negative and the hydrogens are slightly positive. And the, because of that bend, the way they tend to link together is a, actually a very open structure with big holes in it. And that means there's quite a lot of extra sort of basically um, vacuum space in that structure. So when it freezes, it actually um, it releases a load of energy because it means all, lots more extra strong bonds can be made. But it does take up more space. And so ice expands when it freezes. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dave. Answered a very hard question, actually, very, very succinctly. Here's a really fun one, which I think we, should, we can all have a play at, and so can people at home. Steve says, why can't the human body multitask? He's listening in British Columbia, and he says, recent science demo, this person uh, was sitting in a chair. You've got to try this, OK? Try this. Okay. Take your right foot and move it slowly in a clockwise circle. So you're going round in a circle with your foot. Now, he says they did it with, uh, by writing a number six on uh, with the same hand that you're moving your foot on a piece of paper but the better way to show this actually is to take the take your hand that you're on the same side of your body as you're moving your foot now try and make that move in a circle in the opposite direction to your foot so we're going counterclockwise with the hand yes the have hand, a go the foot follows the hand <laughs> <laughs> my my legs going in a figure of eight <laughs> it's very very difficult you can do it with with practice but it is incredibly hard to do if you try and do that number six you'll find that the number six flips around and you start drawing it backwards and and the reason for this is to do with the way your brain codes for movements because you can easily do that if you use the opposite sides of the body if you've got a hand which you do a clockwise circle with in your right hand and then you use your left leg you'll easily do a, a, a circle in the anti-clockwise direction because you're using two different sides of your brain if you're trying to use the same side of your body the motor cortex which is the bit of the brain which codes for movements the way this is working is that it doesn't actually code for a brain cell telling a muscle what to do the brain actually codes for movements by what's called a tuning curve so you have a cluster of nerve cells which fire off when you want to make a movement with a part of the body into a certain direction in space and those nerve cells don't just switch on muscles that move say just the arm they switch on muscles which would move your leg in the same direction too but they turn them on a bit less than the muscles than the motor neurons that control the arm so basically you're facilitating or making it easier for your leg to move in the same direction as your arm but it takes a little bit more switch on to make the leg move as well therefore if you try then to make a movement in the opposite direction with the leg you're basically facilitating another group of nerve cells to move in the opposite direction. So the two things are trying to fight it out, and it's whichever one wins actually ends up going in that direction. And the arm is such a dominant force, there's so much brain devoted to it, that, uh, that I think it probably overwhelms the signal for the leg, which is why the leg finds it very hard to be dominant in that way. But it's, a, it's an amazing demonstration, isn't it? It's great fun. You can, you can have a lot of fun with that at parties. Now, Andrew is on the phone. He's got a question for us. Hello, Andrew. Welcome to The Naked Scientist. Hello. Go for it. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what, is, is there any uh, actual benefit from smoking a lot like a light cigarette as opposed to like a full strength one? Do you smoke? Uh, I've, to be honest, I've just given up because I've, I've been, uh, well, pretty much diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, so I've, uh, I've had to back in. That's a very good idea. James Bond said that giving up smoking is actually really easy. He'd done it hundreds of times. <laughs> um, the thing with smoking is, of course, everyone takes these or uses these light or kind of smooth cigarette brands. They first surfaced in the 50s and 60s. I was doing a bit of research on this because I thought they were more recent than this, but they first surfaced in the 50s and 60s, actually coinciding with when Richard Doll first published studies showing that smoking is bad for you. So it was a sort of response on the part of the cigarette manufacturers to try to market a product that gave the impression that it was in fact healthier. And in fact, 80% of the cigarettes that get smoked worldwide are now of the light variety. And the way they make them light is that they put little holes in the filter and so as the person takes a drag on the cigarette, it draws in some air with the smoke. But what that means is that this can actually lead to a change in behaviour on the part of the person. And in fact, the statistics show that, in fact, smoking light cigarettes is no better for you than smoking full-strength cigarettes. And the reason is that people change their smoking behaviour to accommodate the fact that they're getting a lower nicotine dose. And there was a study which got published in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. It was um, a guy at UCLA in America, Arthur Brody, did this last year. They got people who smoked into the laboratory and they did a thing called a PET scan. This is a way of imaging the brain and they got them to smoke cigarettes and they compared people smoking 
cigarettes that had nicotine in them with cigarettes that had very little nicotine in them or much lower doses to see how many of the receptors for nicotine in the brain got filled by these different varieties of cigarettes. And they found almost the same amount of occupancy. The receptors were getting stimulated just as much, probably because the people were smoking the light cigarettes harder to get the dose up because at the end of the day the cigarette has got nicotine in it and that's the thing you want so people will just titrate up or increase their dose of cigarettes in order to get their nicotine levels to what they want it to be to satisfy their craving and I went looking for any actual evidence that light cigarettes are better on the internet and I found this site the the US National Cancer Institute so this is a government organisation they've, they've got a, a very interesting uh, analysis of this on their website and I'll just read it to you because... Um, it's actually, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't add anything to this, I couldn't put it better myself, but this is really quite staggering. Listen to this. Tobacco companies designed light cigarettes with tiny pinholes on the filters. These filter vents dilute cigarette smoke with air so that when lit cigarettes are puffed by smoking machines, and that's how they get the tar numbers and the nicotine values, which they then report on the packet, this causes the machine to measure an artificially low tar and nicotine level. But many smokers do not know that their cigarettes have these vent holes and the filter vents are uncovered when the cigarettes are smoked on the smoking machines but the filter vents are placed just millimetres from where a smoker puts their lips or fingers when they're smoking and as a result many smokers block the vents when they smoke and this actually turns the light cigarette into a regular cigarette. Some cigarette makers also increase the length of the paper wrapped around the outside of the cigarette filter, and this decreases the number of puffs that occur during a machine test, although the tobacco under the filter is still available to the smoker, and this tobacco is not burned during the machine test. As a result, the machine measures less tar and nicotine than is actually available when the person smokes. And here's the real clincher. Because smokers, unlike machines, crave uh, nicotine, they will inhale more deeply, take larger, more rapid or more frequent puffs or smoke a few extra cigarettes each day to get enough nicotine to satisfy their craving. And this is called compensating and it means that smokers end up inhaling more tar, nicotine and other harmful chemicals than the machines actually would have you believe. So that's uh, actually on the US National Cancer Institute's cancer.gov website. So I think the, the answer is to your question, Andrew, that, that the light cigarettes are basically a way of making you smoke and think you're doing yourself some good. There's no evidence they actually help people improve their health or give up. OK, thank I'm you very, very much. sorry about that. <laughs> good to have you on The Naked Scientist. Thank you. Cheers. Dave, question for you. Uh, Gurjon de Vries, who's listening in the Netherlands, says, why does it get dark at night? Basically, he's saying, if there are all these stars out there in the night sky pumping out all this light, why is the sky not just full of light all the time? Yeah, it's actually a really quite a deep question. If the universe is infinite, then any direction you look in, you ought to end up hitting a star, and therefore surely the whole sky ought to be bright white. The simple answer is because the universe is expanding. Um, the universe is expanding really quite fast, so the further away you go, um, it's expanding as if you were blowing up a balloon, you had dots on the balloon, so the further away you go, the faster things are moving away from us. If you go a really long way away, bi tens of billions of light years away, they're moving away so fast that all the light coming from them has been really, really redshifted. So it's been so redshifted we can't see it. In fact, it's been so redshifted that it's in the microwave region of the spectrum. So there is, you can see light in every direction, but it's been so redshifted that our eyes can't see it, so the sky looks dark. Brilliantly answered. Thank you, Dave. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, with Helen Scales and with Dave Ansell, and it's our science phone-in extravaganza. Any question on anything. And, of course, you can get in touch with us on Twitter as well as via the usual routes, chris at nakedscientist.com. And we have heard from Sky Ponderer. Colin says, how many l cross this is the the nasa mission dave where they launched the projectile into the moon it happened just this last week didn't it he said how many of those would it actually take to change the orbit of the moon by one percent it's an interesting question um what they were doing was they were firing the top stage of a central rocket and they were crashing into the moon and then they've been trying to watch what uh, the plume of stuff which comes up from that and try and see if there's any water in that plume. Now, the central rocket weighs about 2.3 tonnes and it's going at about uh, 10,000 kilometres per hour, that's 2,800 metres per second, which means it's got 6.4 million kilogram metres per second of momentum. That's an awful lot of momentum. If you're anything on Earth, that's a scary amount of momentum. However, the moon has got an awful lot more momentum than that. It's moving at a kilometre a second, and it weighs 7.3 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. 
and that means it's got 7.3 times 10 to the 25 kilogram meters per second momentum. So easy way of saying how it would change its um, orbit by about 1% is how many L-cross, um, cra- L-crosses crashing into it would change its momentum by 1%, and that's 10 to the 19 collisions. <laughs> so that's 10, <laughs> Quite a one few. with 19 <laughs> zeros after it. Um, and actually L-crosses momentum compared to the moon is about the same as one milliliter, one milliliter of water in all, compared to all the water in all the Earth's oceans. It's a drop in the ocean, quite literally. Literally, yes. How do we know how much the moon weighs, out of interest? We know quite accurately because we've sent things to orbit around the moon and the speed at which something orbits around an object is related to its mass and you can do a load of maths and work out exactly how much it weighs. Brilliant. Well, look, back here on Earth, Helen, a couple of fishy questions for you. The first one, I think, well, probably not just fish, but this has got all kinds of animals involved. Jason Roth, who's listening to us in South Africa, says, um, do animals speak regional languages? If I emigrated from South Africa to South America and I took my family dog with me, would his bark be understood by, say, South American dogs? Good question. Animals do, indeed, some of them do have regional accents, if you like, or dialects. Um, Whether or not your dog would understand another dog, I should think, might come down to breeds, but uh, rather than necessarily where it's living in the world. But yes, animals do. We know that some birds have regional accents. I think some amphibians do. And if you jump into the oceans, there are creatures there that definitely have different languages and accents of their own, and that is the whales and dolphins, the cetaceans. And various studies have shown that if you listen listen to uh, the sounds that um, some of these great whales are making, you can actually work out pretty well where it came from. Blue whales, for an exa- as one example, um, scientists have worked out that there are about nine regional populations of blue whales that seem to have their own distinct languages. And so um, that might be something that has implications for things like conservation. Maybe we have to think about those nine populations as being slightly separate and different. Is because the baby whales learn to speak by imitation from parents and that's how this regionalises. Probably. I mean, we know so little really about these amazing creatures given the huge area of ocean that they live in, things like that. These sort of questions we don't yet know. For example, we also don't know if they could understand each other, maybe if between these regions. We don't know that yet. Killer whales are another example of fantastic regional dialects. Um, Along the eastern Pacific um, coast of North America, there's been a lot of study actually of killer whales living around uh, Vancouver and Alaska And these guys also have regional dialects. In fact, you can tell whether or not um, the individual killer whale belongs to a residential population, whether it's a transient um, individual that's coming through, um, or whether it's one from offshore, because all these different killer whales basically speak different accents, um, a little bit like different accents throughout the UK. We could tell where someone comes from from the way they sound. I think this is fantastic. And they've also shown that there's a genetic link, which shows that there seems to be some way that killer whales can tell how we're Related they are to each other and therefore try and avoid problems of things like inbreeding just by the way that they're talking to each other. So I think that's just really fantastic. So they're not xenophobic at all. Can you clear this one up very, very quickly? Because I love this question and I've wondered it myself. Steve says, jellyfish swim in groups. How do they communicate to stay together? Or do they? I don't think they do, actually. Jellyfish are extremely, in some ways, extremely simple creatures. They don't have a brain, so they don't really have the ability to process inputs and, and sensory inputs like that. So, in fact, I think usually when you see large numbers of jellyfish together, it's probably more likely to be the fact that the currents um, and the ocean um, currents are actually moving them together and keeping them in similar places. Or also they, they do... They can respond to things like the availability of food in the water and chemicals and things like that. So possibly they're all following um, food sources and that's why they're all ending up together. But I don't think we yet have an idea that that jellyfish can actually communicate to each other. Although they do have, some of them do have quite complex eyes, which is quite exciting. Um, Box jellyfish have eyes. What do they do with them? That's a very good question. They have quite eyes, a lot Um, quite a lot like humans. In fact, some of the genes they have are very similar to human genes for creating parts of the eye, but we think that happened um, in parallel. In fact, we don't... It wasn't from a common ancestor, but we we arrived at the same solution to having eyes. Um, What do they see? We know they certainly respond to daylight, light and dark. They need to know basically what time of day it is because they tend to come up the water column at night time when there's... um, They're less easily seen by predators and then when it's light, they actually go further down the water column. So they respond to light and dark and even though they have quite complex eyes it's actually a very good eye at detecting things like diffuse light to figure out is it light or dark what time is it should i be up or down in the water column terrific and talking about water i can't resist asking you this dave marianne Deer says 
uh, how far would electricity carry in the sea uh, if a toaster connected to the mains at 240 volts was accidentally dropped into the ocean let's say the north atlantic would the sea life be electrocuted and if so how far and how deep from the toaster would these electrical shock waves travel it's like groundhog day where the guy kind of does the toaster into the bath but it's a very interesting question. See, what conducts electricity reasonably well, but not very well. It's about a ten millionth as good as copper. So you will get electricity flowing through it. But it will also depend on where the other cable is, because electricity always moves from one place to another place. And if, if you're at the Earth, um, the, other side, the other connection to the uh, circuit is an awful long way away, then you get very, very small currents, and it's not going to do you a lot of damage. If you've got two contacts which are sort of a foot apart and a fish swims between them, then it's almost certainly going to get electrocuted. So I think it depends on an awful lot about how you set up this toaster. <laughs> I just like to say I don't want anyone to go and try this for the sake Certainly of the not fish when you're in the water, and anyway, the sake of sure. any divers it might be in the region, <laughs> just in case. Only kidding. I think and of course, with a toaster, if it's got a proper three prong plug, then you've got an earth in there as well. <laughs> so most of the currents can be flowing within the toaster from the live parts of the toaster to the earth. So it's probably it not going to electrocute cable, much it? outside. It's probably just going to draw a very large current and blow the fuse. I have heard of someone turning a lot of electricity into about a million gallons of very hot water in Australia when a flood happened in Adelaide at a medical research institute and flooded a basement and flooded the power board and it didn't trip out for some reason it just passed a very large current through a large amount of water and uh, made the largest jacuzzi you've ever seen but there we are not one you'd want to use i think very big electricity bill went with it we've got a question here from jesse in ithaca in the u.s who says um, i've read that photons can push things and people have considered spaceships propelled by large sheets or mirrors to catch sunlight so if i were in space and i had a flashlight powerful enough to push me um, would it push me and should I aim it towards myself or away from myself? Yeah, and the answer is it does work. In fact, there's something called the YORP effect, Y-O-R-P, Yarkovsky, O'Keefe, Radzievsky, Paddock effect in honour of the four scientists who describe this, first of all. If you look at asteroids and they are spinning in space and they're irregularly shaped, when they have one surface facing at the sun, which is a different size, say, to the other face, then that face gets a disproportionately big push compared with then when the uh, object then turns on its side, for example. And what this does is tre- to create a, a, a push or a torque effect which tends to steer the asteroid and change its path through space. And this is one effect which is thought to have unleashed this barrage of asteroids on Earth that destroyed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago because a Mars, sort of out, out in the vestiges of the early solar system near Mars, are a whole remnants of bits of planet that failed to form. And there are these fairly big objects out there and they are subject to this yawp effect so light can definitely push things along and that could go for a person too we know we can push spacecraft by the same thing this is the whole concept of solar sailing you have a very big collector and when photons are incident on it then they can give it a bit of a nudge and we can work out how much of a nudge a photon when it arrives gives something we know from the Planck constant if you times that by the frequency of the light you can work out how much energy is imparted by a photon a particle of light hitting something and I have to say a very big thank you to Light Arrow on our forum who suggested a very neat solution to this problem so basically yes light can give things a push if our astronaut, astronaut who's drifting around in space were armed with a laser beam and he were armed with a three kilowatt laser beam then the energy the nudge that he would get would be given by the equation F equals W over C, where F is the force and it's equal to W, the wattage of the beam, divided by the speed of light. And the if we put the numbers in, 3 kilowatts is 3 times 10 to the 3, that's the power of our laser. You divide that by the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8, that would tell you that the force that the astronaut would feel through firing the laser would be about 10 to the minus 5 newtons. On Earth, that would be the equivalent of holding up one milligram, in other words, about a thousandth of a gram. So a very small push, but nonetheless, over enough time, given enough time, it would push the astronaut through space. He would have to point the laser in the direction opposite to which he wanted to travel. Dave? And this is actually sort of the ultimate rocket. You get the maximum push for every kilogram of stuff you throw out the back. So if you want to travel a very, very long way, this is the way to do it. Laying the facts bare. I say... The Naked Scientists. In a second, we'll be answering this week's question of the week, where we're finding out why you shouldn't sit too close to the telly. Are there mysterious death rays coming out that are going to be harmful to you? Or is it just a myth that was spawned in the 1950s and 1960s? But first, let's find out the answer to our rather projectile-dominated kitchen science. 
OK, for this kitchen science, I asked you to make a tube out of a biro, um, possibly make the end slightly conical, the holes in the end slightly conical, and then stab it into a potato about a centimetre on each side. So I'll stab it in on one side. I've got one lump of potato in there. So a piece of potato stuck in the tube at one end there. And on the other end now. Fantastic. And I've got a uh, rod, which I'm going to push one of the pieces of potato down the tube with. And I'm going to step well back. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That hit, it, it went a long way. I mean, this, this slug of potato hit the wall on the other side of the room. And quite, made a really fantastic quite Would it hurt noise. if I hit you? I bet it would, actually. I think it probably would. I've been doing them at home, <laughs> and they've gone sort of 10 or 15 metres quite happily. There's some beautiful videos on the website. Um, what happens is, as you, you've got two slugs in the uh, potato in the tube, they actually seal against air really, really well, and they're jammed in by friction. As you push one of them down, you compress the air between the two of them. It compresses and compresses and compresses till the pressure is enough to push the other slug of potato out, overcome friction and push it out. As soon as it starts moving, the friction drops a lot and, ex- and that high pressure air accelerates it down the tube and it fires off. Essentially, it's exactly the same principle as an air gun. Um, in an air gun, you have a piston which squashes air and then that over- overcomes a uh, friction or um, eventually pushes a um, slug down the barrel. It's the same principle as people want to build huge guns to shoot things into space with. How would the effect vary with the diameter of the tube if you use a, a different diameter how does the, the pressure effect change the, uh, the speed that it comes out will probably be quite similar as the tube increases but you'll be firing a bigger lump so it's going to hurt more when it hits you so it's nothing to do with the fact that um you know the old no. experiment in school where you have a small syringe and a big fat syringe connected by a piece of pipe and the person who's got the small syringe can always beat the person with the big syringe because the pressure is different is there a pressure effect here Actually, thinking about it, there will be a pressure effect um, in a, a slightly more subtle one than that, and that is that because the radius, um, the because as you double, if you double the radius, you quadruple the area. That means that, uh, and the mass will go up a lot more. Um, the friction is relatively less on a big tube than a small tube, so it might not come out as fast. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Dave. So now you know how to make your own do-it-yourself air gun. Diana, welcome. Hello. (laughs) Yes, it's time for question of the week. And this week, everyone in the team has had their nose pressed against the screen. Hello, this is Claudia from Argentina. I have a question for you. When I was little, my parents always insisted that I keep a safety distance from the TV. Was that a human myth or to save me from some mysterious rays coming from the TV? And what about now? Should I insist that my son keep a safety distance from the computer screen or the TV screen? Does somebody know this? Is it harmful? Thank you very much. I love your show. Bye. Is it radiation or is there a danger that a Japanese horror movie might pop out of the telly? Hello, I'm Andy Karam. I'm an adjunct professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Televisions really do give off radiation. But having said that, it's only a little bit of radiation and it's not that dangerous. What happens is that anything with a cathode ray tube, a tube where you shoot high-energy electrons at some sort of screen, when those electrons hit the screen, they give off very low-energy X-ray radiation. This is the same way that X-rays are produced in regular X-ray tubes. So if you're sitting close to a cathode ray tube, whether a computer monitor, a television screen, a radar set, or anything else with that type of technology, you're going to be getting low doses of X-ray radiation. Now, having said that, I've got to emphasize their low doses of radiation. It's not enough to be dangerous, and in fact, if you watch your television for several hours a day all year, you're getting less radiation than you would from a single medical x-ray and less radiation than you get from the radioactivity that's just naturally within your body. So it's something that we can measure, but it's not something that's harmful. LCD and plasma screens don't give off any radiation at all. They don't use the high-energy electrons. It's a different type of technology. I could not say that they're safer because I don't consider the radiation from cathode ray tubes to be a risk, but I can say that they give off less radiation. As far as sitting too close to the television goes, the further back you are, the lower the radiation dose will be, 
But having said that, I don't consider the radiation dose even at a distance of just one meter to be dangerous. So nothing too radioactive, even from the old televisions. And it seems there's not much evidence that sitting close to the television will damage your eyesight either. But in the 1960s, when TVs were a relatively new object in the home, radiation and eyesight were two major concerns of the viewers, as opposed to maybe the brain wasting caused by watching too much daytime talk show. And on our forum, we had answers from board chemist who said being close to the TV is dangerous because you block the grown-ups view. Anyway, and Shims said that industry standards now imposed are in place to limit radiation from tellies and also that sitting too close might give you eye strain but you won't damage your sight. That madman added that the flicker on old TV displays might add to the eye strain part of it. We might just need to have a whole load of adults sitting two feet from a screen and then a whole load more ten feet away and see if it affects their eyesight. (laughs) Indeed. Well, next week we've a question about an animal that doesn't have a problem with eyes since quite often it has lots of them. Hello, my name's Charlie and I'm from Milton Keynes and I have this question about the spider. How does a spider work out all the positions for the different elements of its web? Is it a brilliant mathematician? So, how do spiders make their webs without the aid of a set square and a tape measure? We need your help, so email us with your answer or post it on the forum at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum and we'll tackle it next week. Thank you very much, Diana. That's Diana O'Carroll with this week's Question of the Week. And in fact, you can catch up with more Questions of the Week, which are all published as a podcast in their own right on our website at nakedscientist.com forward slash QOTW. Or you can find it on iTunes. Again, Question of the Week. Don't forget, if you have an answer to that question, you can place that on our forum at nakedscientist.com forward slash forum. You might get mentioned in next week's show, who knows? Well, that's it for this week, and thank you very much to our wonderful production team. I have to say a very big thank you to Ben Valsler and Mira Senthalingam, who do an amazing job for us. And uh, next time, we're actually heading up Everest. We'll be finding out how one of our team fared as she ascended to the dizzy heights of the top of the world in the Himalayas. How did altitude affect her? Plus, we'll be finding out on the subject of big mountains how mountain ranges like the Himalayas actually affect the world's weather and the world's climate over millions of years. So if you have any rock-related questions, do please send them in, chris at thenakedscientist.com. In the meantime, don't forget also that the World Podcast Awards are running at the moment. They're open for nominations, so if you would like to recommend your favourite science show, then the Naked Scientists are standing for Best Produced and also for Best Technology and Science Show. If you think we deserve a nomination, we'd be grateful indeed for you to nominate us. That's at podcastawards.com. In the meantime, thank you for listening. Have a great week and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. The Naked Scientist podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientist.com.